assalamu alaikum my dear students i am dr zahid and today we are going to discuss a very important topic that is cerebral venous sinus thrombosis cerebral is a rare disease and it is characterized by thrombosis of the cerebral venous sinuses of the brain uh, incidence is not known <coughs> male to female ratio is 1.3 to 1 males age distribution is uh, uniform throughout ages while female has got a higher incidence of uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in uh, childbearing age these are the, uh, the fre uh, frequent sites of venous sinus thrombosis the most commonly venous sinus thrombosis occurs in superior sagittal sinus followed by transverse straight and sigmoid sinuses cortical veins can also be involved for example vein of lab vein of crow lord deep veins like internal cerebral and thalamostriate veins and cavernous sinus thrombosis can also occur so these this is a schematic diagram of uh, different venous sinus sinuses of the brain see that this is superior sagittal sinus and it is connected with transverse sinuses of right and left side and from the uh, this transverse sinus sigmoid sinus arises and it goes it is uh, it goes into the jugular vein and here the inferior sagittal sinuses also joins the transverse and superior sagittal sinus and this is the vein of prolord this is the vein of gallon and this is the vein of lave in neonates shock and dehydration is the most common cause while in older older children local infections such as mastoiditis and coagulopathy uh, these are the major causes in adults coagulopathies are the major cause and infection constitutes the second most common cause and in women of childbearing age oral contraceptive usage and pregnancy are the strongest risk factors so prothrombotic conditions oral contraceptives pregnancy and puerperium malignancy infection head injury and mechanical precipitants these are the common causes of uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and these causes can be identified in up to 85 percent of the cases while 15 percent of the cases usually remain unknown these are the causes of thrombophilia that can be there please have a look and remember what happens in cerebral venous sinus thrombosis there is a procoagulant st state because of these risk factors as we have discussed and it leads to thrombosis of the cerebral venous sinus this results in obstruction to the venous blood flow the obstruction to the venous blood flow causes increased capillary and venous pressure and this increased capillary and venous pressure results in vasogenic edema because of the disruption of the blood brain barrier and the, this increased capillary and venous pressure can also result in venous hemorrhage and venous infarction and uh, there is decreased perfusion pressure, pressure of the brain which results in damage to the cells and causes cytotoxic edema and decreased CSF resorption can also add to raised intracranial pressure of the brain. So this is the pathogenesis of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. There are three major syndromes uh, of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. The first one is isolated intracranial hypertension syndrome. It is characterized with headache, epilidema, and vigor problems. The patient comes with you headache of gradual onset and of a gradual progression. And when you perform fentoscopy, there is papilledema, and the patient has got complaint of blurring. It can include transient obscurations or they can be altitudinal defects. And the second syndrome is focal syndrome. Focal syndrome is characterized by focal deficits or seizures or both. Focal deficits means there can be weakness of one side of the body, there can be uh, deviation of angle of the mouth, etc. And encephalopathy is characterized by changes of the men mental status like stupor or coma, etc. So these are the less common presentations like cavernous sinus syndrome. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is very rare and there can be multiple cranial palsies. 
So the first investigation that we perform is a CD scan brain plane. And CD scan identifies, it can identify an infarction, it can identify a, a hemorrhage or direct signs of thrombus formation. While the definite diagnosis is made by MRI brain and a magnetic resonance venogram, uh, or in some cases, we may need to go to digital subtraction angiography. We'll see in detail uh, what are the findings on these uh, radiological uh, uh, So uh, on a routine non-enhanced MRRCT, you should think of the possibility of venous thrombosis when you see one of these direct signs of thrombus. We'll see infarction in a non-arterial location, especially if it is bilateral and hemorrhagic. Cortical or peripheral lobar hemorrhage, cortical edema. So here you can see three CD scan brain plane. And in these three CD scans, there are infarctions of the arterial origins. This is the infarction of the anterior cerebral artery. This is infarction of the middle cerebral artery and this is infarction of the posterior cerebral artery so these are infarctions of the arterial territories please identify these arterial territories here you you are seeing you're uh, having a look at uh, venous infarctions this is this venous infarction is involving posterior cerebral artery as well as middle cerebral artery as well and it is characterized by hemorrhage. There is hemorrhage of this infarction. And there is also edema of this, uh, this infarction. You can see that the midline is shifted. So these three characteristics make it more likely to be a venous infarction. So when to think of venous thrombosis? When you see a sign of direct thrombus direct sign of thrombus. It can be a dense clot sign, a cord sign, an empty delta sign, or loss of normal flow by on magnetic resonance imaging. And venous infarction. Venous infarction are usually bilateral in parasitical or biothalamic regions. It can be a temporal lobe infarction, cortical edema, or hemorrhage, and peripheral lobar hemorrhage. So these are the characteristics of a venous infarction. So, it is a CD scan brain plane, and here you can see a direct thrombus. There's a triangular hyperdensity at the level of confluence of sinuses, where the superior sagittal sinus and transverse sinus meets with each other. So this is the dense clot sign. And here you can see a linear hyperdensity. This is thrombosis of a cortical vein, and this is called a cord sign. If you can see a venous infarction, this is hypodensity and this is hyperdensity, okay? And you can also see a direct sign of thrombus. This uh, linear hyperdensity in, uh, at this level, this is basically thrombosis of the left transverse vein. So this is a venous infarction and thrombosis of the left transverse sinus. So these are the areas in which you are expecting thrombosis uh, uh, and uh, infarctions in, in patients with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So this is thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. You will expect an infarction and hemorrhage in these areas, in these whitish areas. While if there is thrombosis of the internal cerebral vein, like in the inter -cerebr internal cerebral or thalamostriate veins, the infarction or hemorrhage will be in these areas. If there is thrombosis of the vein of lab, the infarction or hemorrhage will be in this area. This is basically a CD scan brain uh, enhanced with contrast. You know, contrast goes to the areas where the blood goes. Okay. If there is thrombus, then there will be no blood at the level of thrombus. Okay. So this, uh, the, this is dura, and this is the space between the dural sinus. And here there is a thrombus. 
that's why it is not taking up the contrast while the surrounding dural wall is taking up the contrast and it is making a sign of a delta so this sign is called empty delta sign and it is visible on CD scan brain enhanced with a contrast here you can again see a thrombus in both right and left transverse sinuses and here you can see uh, flowing blood looks black on an MR uh, MRI while the thrombosed blood uh, in a vessel uh, is stagnant and it looks uh, hyper intense on MRI. This is a magnetic resonance venogram and here you can see that the right sided uh, transverse sinus is not visible and it means there is thrombosis of the right transverse cerebral venous uh, sinus so magnetic resonance is basically the gold standard of diagnosing cerebral venous sinus thrombosis so this is uh, teacher subtraction angiography um, we usually uh, perform this investigation before going for the endovascular uh, intervention of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis when the patient is not responding to anticoagulation thrombosis so when you are done with diagnosing cerebral venous sinus thrombosis you have to look for the etiologic causes because it makes a big difference in uh, treatment of the patient you have to identify the uh, cause whether it's dehydration or any kind of infection or there is a prothrombophilic state so uh, these investigations are to find out the cause of prothrombophilia any antiphospholipid antibodies antiphospholipid antibodies are anticardiolipid antibodies or lupus anticoagulant uh, factor 5 latent deficiency antithrombin 3 levels protein c and s levels homocysteinemia for hyperhomocysteinemia and prothrombin gene mutation so we have three aims in order to treat CVT: to recanalize the occluded sinus survey to prevent the propagation of the thrombus to treat the underlying prothrombotic state. Our first step is early anticoagulation. Now mind it, whenever there is bleeding inside the brain, anticoagulation should be avoided. But, but this is one instance where you have to give anticoagulation even if there is a hemorrhage inside the brain because the cause of that bleeding is cerebral venous sinus thrombosis because of the thrombus and back pressure hemorrhage has occurred and until and unless we treat the thrombus the bleeding is going to increase so anticoagulation is the treatment we can do uh, uh, the treatment in acute state with unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin and when the patient becomes stable we can switch over to warfarin or novel oral anticoagulants now these novel oral anticoagulants are Rivaroxaban or Dabigatran, etc. There are so many, and these have been uh, introduced recently. And uh, previously, there was uh, no trial available uh, uh, of these novel oral anticoagulants in cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. But now, now the results of these uh, trials uh, have started to come, and Dabigatran. Uh, uh, is, has shown uh, a lot of promise in treating cerebral venous sinus, sinus thrombosis. Uh, there are a lot of trials going on uh, of rivaroxaban in treatment of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So uh, the duration of this anticoagulation is important. In next slide, we'll if patient has a transient risk factor uh, of uh, uh, procoagulant state like dehydration or pregnancy and perperium these are the transient transient risk factors then three to six months of anticoagulation is enough if the patient has got no provoked uh, provoking risk factor then this anticoagulation should be continued for six to twelve hours but if the patient is having a condition which cannot be treated like a prothrombophilia state or malignancy untreatable malignancy then this treatment uh, this anticoagulation should be 
continued for life. If a patient is put on anticoagulation and still the condition is worsening, for example, mental status changes are increasing, patient goes into stupor or coma despite of treatment, the patient's status is not improving, then we may need to thrombolyze. This thrombolysis can be chemical with urokinase or streptokinase. Or it can be with mechanical thrombectomy. Meanwhile, we have to give supportive treatment to, to this patient. Uh, as I have already told you, that intracranial pressure may increase. For this, <coughs> put the patient uh, with elevated head uh, end of the bed. Uh, intensive care admission may be necessary. Patient should be mildly sedated. Osmotic therapy with mannitol should be given, and patient might need hyperventilation with a target of partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide to 30 to 35 millimeter of mercury. And in some cases, we may need to monitor the intracranial pressure invasively. Sometimes all these measures are not sufficient, and we may have to revert to hemicraniectomy. In hemicraniectomy, we remove a flap of the skull, uh, so brain have a space to expand and there is no uh, actual damage to the structure of the brain so hemi hemicraniectomy may be necessary uh, the patient may have seizures so in that case we have to give anti-epileptic drugs like levetiracetam or um, uh, valproic acid or in some cases phenytoin needs to be given and uh, if there is an infectious etiology antibiotics according to the infection site and pattern of the infection should be given. Mortality, if left untreated, 50% mortality is there. If no specific cause can be identified, 10% mortality is there. Septic cause has got a higher uh, uh, risk of mortality of 30%. Outcome, 77% improved with no sequelae, 20% developed thrombosis intra or extracerebrally longest follow-up is studies up to eight years so uh, uh, prognosis is good if treated earlier and adequate so uh, summary of this condition is it's a rare but fatal disease uh, it has go got so many mimickers for example this headache which comes with papilledema these can be uh, very closely mimicked by benign intracranial hypertension because sometimes the uh, uh, imaging signs are so subtle that if one is not very uh, careful about the diagnosis of this condition, one may uh, confuse this condition with benign intracranial hypertension. And with treatment, the prognosis is better. But if untreated, there can be mortality of 50%. If treated, majority of patients have no long-term disability. And underlying cause should always be sought. So it's a treatable reversible condition and you need to keep a very uh, low threshold for this uh, when you come across such a patient. Thank you so much for listening.